Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning study. It's August 15th. Of course, that's a symbol of the midnight cry. And uh, we're going to continue this study uh, addressing uh, uh, the kings of Persia and the events that occur in this history from uh, basically the fall of Babylon until the Second Temple period. So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for all the things that you have shown us in your word. And we invite your Holy Spirit to be here as we open your word together. We ask that uh, the things that we learn will be practical in our lives, that they will bring a power and conviction. And that... Um, each person who is studying these things can search them out for themselves and see these truths. We know, Lord, that there's much we don't understand, but we pray that your Holy Spirit can help us as we follow the rules that you've given us in Bible study and that we can um, continue to unfold these truths, that they can be um, a benefit in uh, giving this message to the church and then to the world. We invite your Holy Spirit now into our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, there's not as many of us here this morning, but I welcome you, and I'm sure a few others will pop up, pop into the study as we go along. So um, what we had addressed yesterday was the enemies that had opposed um, the building of the temple. And uh, we looked at this chart here. We had addressed um, the reign of Cyrus, Cambyses, and we started looking at false smirtus, what happened in this history. And um, we're going to, again, look at the scriptures relating to this and a couple of points that uh, I want to bring out. So when we, we start here in Ezra chapter 4, we remember that these adversaries of Judah and Benjamin um, hear that this temple is going to be built. Now, when they come to Zerubbabel, what history do they point back to? It says, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esar Hadon, king of Asher, or Assyria, which brought us up hither. So what history are they referring back to? Time of Manasseh. Okay, so this is in the time of Manasseh. So this is Esar Hadon. We have the name there. Um, you know, in Hebrew, it's Asar Hadon, but it's Esar Hadon. That's who we understand that king to be. He's going to uh, be the one who takes Manasseh captive. So he's the king of Assyria and the king of Babylon. Right. So there's, this is the only time we have the king of Assyria and the king of Babylon is the same king. So we know that it must be in the time of, of Esar Hadon when Manasseh is taken captive because he's taken captive by the king of Assyria and brought to Babylon. And until we found this document called Prism B, it's a, a prism with a cuneiform uh, writing in it, um, where S.R. Hayden talks about taking Manasseh captive. Uh, we actually had no way of knowing, you know, archaeologically speaking, that what was in the Bible was true. So once this was found, this prism, then scholars said, oh, I guess... Manasseh was taken to Babylon. Now, with uh, the study of the 2520, that was one of the things that I had to address, is that there was this criticism that um, it wasn't Esar Hayden that took Manasseh captive, even though we have the record of him doing so, right? That this had to have happened later in Manasseh's reign, and that Esar Hayden didn't fit the chronology um, that Edwin Thiel, an Adventist chronologist, had set up. And so 
people who are actually arguing against 677 for Esser Hayden, conservative Adventists, didn't realize that they were accepting a chronology that rejects the scriptures. Now, some people who um, opposed the 2520 made an argument that Manasseh could not have been in Babylon in 677 because of Prism B, because they say, well, Esther Hayden took Manasseh captive in 677. Manasseh went to Assyria. And so he couldn't be in Babylon. So they would be arguing that he had to have been taken captive twice. Now, the document does not say he was carried to Babylon. It says that him and 21 other uh, kings of Palestine and the seacoast were gathered together. That is mustered. The word in um, in Assyrian is adkima, and it's used for gathering building materials, armies, or slaves. So it's just the word we would translate it as mustard. Now, some translations of the Assyrian document say um, that they were called, um, which is a bad translation of the word akidma, because if you look at every place it's used, it's always used in the sense of mustering troops or building materials or slaves. So, so they were mustered. They were gathered together to one place, and they were sent out to haul timber to Nineveh. So this would be the affliction that's talked about in um, 2 Chronicles 33, verse 11, when Manasseh was taken captive. So, so Esar Hayden is definitely the one who took Manasseh captive. He's also going to repopulate northern Israel uh, with people from all these different places. And these become the Samaritans. Now, when we look at... Um, this letter to, as it says, to King Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes, as Ellen White clearly states, is false smirtus. Now it says, in the days of Artaxerxes, wrote Bishlam, Mithridath, Tabil, and the rest of their companions unto Artaxerxes, the king of Persia. And the writing of the letter was written in the Syrian tongue. Syrian, of course, this would be um, Chaldean or uh, Syriac, right? So... Um, this is Aramaic, right? And interpreted in the Syrian tongue. Riam the chancellor and Shimshai the scribe wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes the king in this sort. So, yeah, so there in this manner. So this is the manner in which it was written. Then wrote Riam the chancellor and Shimshai the scribe and the rest of their companions and it names all these different people, these different groups, and the rest of the nations whom the great noble a snapper. So we said that a snapper is Ashurbanipal. That's the general consensus. He is uh, the descendant. He's the son of Esar Hayden. Now, why in this letter do they not refer to Esar Hayden, but why do they refer to Ashurbanipal. Why are they in in this history? So this is the same group of people. These are Samaritans, right? They're they're opposed to the building of this temple, and uh, this is about you know sixteen years or so later after this foundation of this temple has been laid. So why do they refer to Ashurbanipal and not to Esar Hayden? Does anybody have any ideas why that is? So remember, they're writing to... Um, Paul Smyrtus, so he's the king of Persia. And they're telling them their their history of who they are. But they refer to Ashurbanipal, but not to Esar Hayden. Though they referred to Esar Hayden when they talked um, uh, to Zerubbabel, Jer Zer 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 right? Um, what's his name? Zer Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, there we go. 
Zerubbabel and uh, Joshua and those guys. So why why Asher Banipal? Any ideas on that? So what's the difference between Asher Banipal and Esar Hayden as far as Persia would be concerned? Would it would it matter to them? Um, if it was Esar Hayden, if they said, you know, since the days of Esar Hayden, because Esar Hayden is the one who brought them over. Now, obviously, Asher Banipal did as well. Okay, let's let's read on in this letter. So this is the copy of the letter they sent unto him, even unto Artaxerxes the king, thy servants, the men on this side river, and at such time, be it known unto the king. That the Jews which came up from thee to us are come unto Jerusalem, building the rebellious and the bad city, and have set up the walls thereof and joined the foundations. Um, be it known now unto the king that if this city be builded and the walls set up again, then will they not pay, then they will not pay toll, tribute, and custom, and so thou shalt endamage the revenue of the kings. Now, because we have maintenance from a king's palace, from the king's palace, and it was not meet for us to see the king's dishonor, therefore we have sent and certified the king that the search be made in the book of the records of thy fathers. So shalt thou find in the book of the records and know that this city is a rebellious city and hurtful unto, the, unto kings and provinces, and that they have moved sedition within the same of the old time, and for which cause was this city destroyed? We certify the king that if by this means thou shalt have no portion on this side the river. So what what is how are they appealing to uh, false murders? What are they telling him? Okay, so tax and sedition, right? So the whole the whole issue is they're not really telling their problem. They're making this like this is the king's problem, right? That uh, false murders, that that this is going to be a problem for him. They're not talking about their situation, even though that's what they're really concerned about. They make it look like they're concerned about his situation. Now, so here we have uh, this reference to Ashurbanipal. So Ashurbanipal is the king of Assyria. And we know that um, in this history, Assyria had fallen in 609, right? And Babylon had arose. So Babylon had conquered Assyria. And they want them to look in the record books. So what record books are they going to look into? Where are they going to find these records? What is he directing? What are they directing him to to look? Would it be the history uh, connected? Okay. The history connected to Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, so so there would be the history connected to Nebuchadnezzar. Now you've seen before in these studies, I've brought up uh, this document, uh, cuneiform document, which is um, uh, called the Babylonian Chronicles. Now it's actually called ABC. That is the Assyrian and Babylonian chronicles. And these chronicles, copies were made of these and distributed um, in the different cities of the empire. Now, included in this, um, um, we also we, we have both Assyrian and Babylonian histories. Now, Esar Hayden um, is not part of that. That is, Esar Hayden 
Hadrian is um, because he was king of both Assyria and Babylon. Uh, politically, there was a problem with him. Now, so when they refer to Ashurbanipal, what they're wanting them to do is to go back to these Assyrian records and the Babylonian records, the Assyrian and Babylonian chronicles, and look at this these documents to see the history of this people that they have been rebellious, right? See, they're a rebellious and bad city, right? Now, they haven't actually set up the walls, right? We know that there's some misinformation here. Um, but they want them to, they want uh, Fall Smyrtus to look at this record and to stop this building. Now, you know, what is it that they're actually concerned about, the Samaritans? Are the Samaritans actually concerned? that Judah is not going to pay tribute to um, to Babylon or to Persia, I guess, here in this case, that they're going to stop paying tribute. Is that what they're concerned about? What What is their concern? Why are they opposing this work? Because they wanted to be a part of it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so why are they opposing it? Because they were rejected. Okay, they were rejected. So there is jealousy and envy going on here, correct? I would think so. Yeah. So we can see that this, this work of the enemies is not an honest work. And that it's political in its scope. So so that's what's happening here in this story. And, and they're choosing their words wisely. So, so they... They refer to Ashurbanipal, but not to Esarhaddon, uh, because they want to direct the king to these records. Now, we'll see later with Darius that a different search is going to be made. So all they find here is this record, the chronicles of the Assyrian and the Babylonian kings, the Assyrian and Babylonian chronicles, are just going to re record the battles uh, that they have had, right? So when they look in these records, they're going to see that Judah is bad, right? They're, they're going to read that we don't have the complete Babylonian chronicles. Uh, we don't actually have the chronicles that address the destruction of Jerusalem in 586. So they would have seen that history. They would have seen that Jerusalem was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and um they would have seen the captivity of Zedekiah. They would have seen that whole history um, that occurs. They, we have the part where Zedekiah is placed on the throne by Nebuchadnezzar and Jehoiachin is taken captive. But we don't have the record of the destruction of Jerusalem. It'd be really nice if we found that one day because then we would have uh, more information uh, to confirm what we already know, but it would be pretty interesting to see what the Babylonians recorded regarding the destruction of Jerusalem. But anyway, that's that's what's happening in this history. So we can see that there is this um, politicizing of this issue, that they're not being honest about why they're going to him. They have a false reason, something that they're really not worried about because the city isn't being built at this point. It's just the temple. Okay. So they're just trying to set up their worship. Um, okay. So then we're going to have the response. So um, the Bible calls Artaxerxes. This king is actually false murders. And and he the king sent an Answer unto Rehum the chancellor and to Shimshai the scribe and to the rest of the, their companions that dwell in Samaria and unto the rest beyond the river. Peace and at such time. The letter which ye sent unto us has been plainly read before me. And I commanded and search had been made. And it is found that this city of old time hath made insurrection against kings and that rebellion and sedition have been made therein. There have been mighty kings also over Jerusalem, which have ruled over all countries beyond the river, and toll and tribute and custom was paid unto them. Give ye now commandment to cause these men to cease, and that the city be not built until another commandment shall be given from me. 
Take heed now that ye fail not to do this. And why should damage grow to the hurt of the kings? Now, when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter, so we know this is false Smyrtus, was read before Rehum and Shimshai the scribe and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem unto the Jews and made them cease by force and power. Then ceased the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased unto the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So it's pretty clear that this can't be Artaxerxes, you know, Longimanus, right? This can't be Artaxerxes who gives the decree in 457 BC. This Artaxerxes has to be somebody before Darius, king of Persia. Okay, so it makes sense. Even though there's lots of people in reading this, I've read so many chronologies where people try to take Ahasuerus, not to be Cambyses, but Xerxes, and Artaxerxes to be Artaxerxes Longimanus, even though it's pretty clear uh, that this isn't the case. Now, what they will try to do is they will try to take this Darius, king of Persia, as some other Darius later on. But uh, thankfully, we have the spirit of prophecy uh, that actually helps us sort this out. Though I did sort it out before I looked at the spirit of prophecy statements. So now we look at Ezra chapter 5. Uh, so it says, Then the prophets Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. Then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Yeshua, the son of Josedek, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. And with them were the prophets of God helping them. So under the prophesying of Haggai and Zechariah, this, is, this construction is going to resume. Right. So we're going to look again at these charts. Okay, so um, we got this one, but let's move this other one, which is going to be right here. So here we have, okay. John 12, verse 3 to 6. Okay, yeah, so... There's always this political stuff going on, Angela's just commenting on. Okay, so we see here, um, Darius begins to reign. It's going to be the 10th day of the seventh month on the Babylonian calendar, September 29th, 522 BC. And um, it's going to be in the second year of his reign that Haggai and Zechariah are going to begin their prophesying. Um Zechariah continues into the fourth year of, of um, Darius, right? So he's going to have in chapter seven, that's going to be in the fourth year, but he begins prophesying in the second year. Haggai, all of his prophesying is in the second year of Darius. So, so we can see that there. I'll make this a little bigger, so. So you can see here, this is in 520 uh, BC. And then this period from the spring of 520 to 519 is the second year of Darius. And you're going to see that um, December 7th, 518 is going to be Zechariah's uh, second vision or third vision, I guess, um, <clears throat> in the fourth year. As you can see, it's near the end of the fourth year of Darius. So the prof so the building's going to start here. So it's going to start in 520. So we can see that the decree can't be in 520. Because this is just going to start or commence this building. And even in Zechariah 7, so let's go there. So second Zechariah chapter 7. It says it came to pass in, I got to just switch my screen, sorry.
And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Darius that the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah in the fourth day of the ninth month, even in the month Kislev. When they sent unto the house of God, Sherezer and Regamelech, and their men to pray before the Lord and to speak unto the priests, which are in the house of the Lord of hosts and to the prophets saying, should I weep in the fifth month, separating myself as I have done these so many years. Then came the word of the Lord of hosts unto me saying, speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests saying, when he fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those 70 years, did ye at all fast unto me, even to me. Now, we know this 70 years is not the 70 years of the Babylonian captivity. So the fast of the fifth month and the fast of the seventh month. So what happens in the fifth, fifth month? What year are they going to begin this fast of the fifth month? Probably the year after the city has been destroyed. Okay, so the year after the city is destroyed. So it's going to be destroyed in 586. So in 585 is the first time that they're going to fast. Now, somebody could argue, well, they're going to fast when the city is destroyed. But these are commemorative fasts, right? And in the fast of the seventh month, that's the commemoration of the death of Gedaliah who is the governor. He's going to be killed two months after uh, Jerusalem is destroyed, after the, the temple is destroyed. So the temple is destroyed in the fifth month, right? So there's actually a fast of the of the fourth month, a fast of the fifth month, a fast, fast of the seventh month, and a fast of the tenth month. The one in the fourth month has to do with the end of the siege. The tenth month, they have a fast that has to do with the beginning of the siege, Right. So when the siege began, they commemorate that in the 10th month, because it's going to be on the 10th day of the 10th month. Um, but the fast of the fifth month and the seventh month are mentioned here as occurring for 70 years. Now, we know when we look at Zechariah 1 verse 12, it's going to use an identical expression. It says, um, against which thou hast indignation these three score and ten years. Um, how long will not, not have mercy on Jerusalem, uh, Judah and Jerusalem, against which thou hast had indignation these three score and ten years? So that expression, these three score and ten years, is identical to uh, those 70 years. It's, it's identical in Hebrew, even though it's translated differently. Now, in Hebrew, there is no these and those. There's no here or there, this or that, right? They don't have those distinctions that we do in English. So, so this could easily be translated these 70 years. That is, the 70 years being referred to, it hasn't yet been 70 years since uh, Jerusalem was destroyed. So Jerusalem is destroyed in 586. And when we look at this, this uh, prophecy is in, if we look at it here again on this chart, this Zechariah chapter 7 is, is in 518. So if we go from the first time that they fast, and, and this is later in 518, how many fasts have they had? How many years have they been fasting? Yeah. yeah, so so if their first fast was then in, I'm just trying to figure this out exactly. Yeah, I think that would have been 68. So so their 70th fast would be in 516, right? So they fasted for 68 years. They The 68th time they fasted was in 518. So... Why does the angel refer to it as 70 years? Is this the angel just rounding it down or rounding it up, I mean? Yeah, it's just and we see the same thing in chapter one. They're going to refer to this period of 70 years 
Um, and again, it's the same period. It's the period that the temple was laid in ruins in Zechariah chapter 1. So why does the angel call it 70 years when it's going to be 66 years on the one hand and 68 years on the other? It's uh, marking a 70-year period. Okay, so the angel is marking a 70-year period that is going to be complete, right? The, the, the temple is going to be in ruins for 70 years. So if, if, if Zechariah can do the math, he would know that this has to be built at the end of that 70 years in, in Zechariah chapter 7 is still two years away. Right? So, so this is something that just is generally not noticed. It's an important detail, but it's usually just ignored. Right? Mostly what people do is they see 70 years and what do they think? It's the 70 years of the Babylonian captivity. Which, of course, it can't be because they didn't fast in the fifth and the seventh month. Um, if, if you're just referring to the Babylonian captivity and you're saying that this is during that time, um, it, it wouldn't make sense to talk about 70 years of fasting for the Babylonian captivity. This is for the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And, of course, Zechariah and Haggai, their whole prophesying is about rebuilding the temple. So that's their focus. So Zechariah is talking about the temple, not the Babylonian captivity. Okay. So under Haggai and, Zechari and Zechariah, we're going to have this rebuilding. Now, we've studied this um, when we were looking at Zechariah, um, that, that this rebuilding is going to happen because Zerubbabel, who laid the foundation, he's going to uh, complete the temple, right? So he began the work, he's going to finish it, according to Zechariah. Um, so, so they begin this building. So it says, then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedek, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. And with them were the prophets of God helping them. And at the same time, came to them Tatnai, governor on this side river, and Sheshabosnai and their companions and said thus unto them, Who hath commanded you to build this house and to make up this wall? Then said we unto them after this manner, What are the names of the men that make this building? But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews. They could not cause them to cease. Till the matter came to Darius. So now Darius is going to hear about this matter. So first we know that there was you know, opposition in the time of Cambyses. But you know nothing came of that. It didn't stop the building. But then under false murders, when they complained, then it stopped the building of the temple. But now they have resumed the building of the temple. So it's some time after they have resumed the building that the Samaritans are going to recognize that this is happening and they're going to say, what are you guys doing? And so this matter is going to come to Darius. Um, to the matter. And it's kind of an interesting word here because um, it's, it's a word that means properly to taste. It's, it's Chaldean. Um, uh, and, so we're going to have a Darius here um, who's going to hear this matter. So this is actually like a judicial matter. So it's it's to judge, right? So they're using the sense of the word taste as to judge, which is interesting. Anyway, and then they return to answer by letter concerning this matter. So this is the copy of the letter that Tatnai, governor on this side, the river, and Sheth, Sheth Abor Bosnai, and his companions, the Afarkasites, which were on this side of the river, sent unto Darius the king. They sent a letter unto him wherein was written thus, Unto Darius king, all peace, be it known unto the king, that we went into the province of Judea 
to the house of the great God, which is builded with great stones and timber and laid in the walls. And this work goeth fast on and prospereth in their hands. Then asked we those elders and said unto them, thus, who commanded you to build this house and to make up these walls? And we asked their names also to certify thee that we might write the names of the men that were the chief of them. And thus they returned us answer saying, we are the servants of the God of heaven and earth and build the house that was builded these many years ago, which a great king of Israel built it and set up. But after that, our fathers had provoked the God of heaven to wrath and gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed this house and carried the people away into Babylon. But in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Babylon, the same king Cyrus made a decree to build this house of God and the vessels also of the gold and silver of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took out of the temple that was in Jerusalem and brought them into the temple of Babylon. Those did Cyrus the king take out of the temple of Babylon, and they were delivered unto one whose name was Sheshbazar, whom he had made governor. And he said unto him, Take these vessels and go carry them into the temple that is in Jerusalem, and let the house of God be builded in this place. Then came the same Sheshbazar and laid the foundation of the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And since that time, even until now, hath it been building, and yet it is not finished. Now, therefore, if it seem good to the king, let there be search made in the king's treasure house, which is there at Babylon, whether it be so that a decree was made of Cyrus the king, to build this house of God at Jerusalem and let the king send his pleasure to us concerning this matter. Now, this letter is quite a bit different characteristic uh, than the letter that was given to um, uh, false murders. So what, what's the difference here? What does this let? How is this letter written? That's different. So in false murders, we could see all the political undertones it's, it's appealing to um you know the money situation we don't see that in this letter right and and we see here actually the argument that is given on the side of god's people right Now, the Shesh Bazaar um, that they use here, because this is written in, in uh, um, uh, Syriac or Chaldean or um, uh, the other word, I just can't think of it. Um, Assyrian, not, not Assyrian. Uh, what's the word? Assyriac, right? So Syriac. Chaldean and um, Aramaic, right? So this is written in Aramaic. So we see Shesh Bazar, his name, that's just going to be uh, them uh, pronouncing the name uh, Jerubal or Zerubbabel. So they're going to call it Shesh Bazar. Okay, so, so what do we see here? What's going to happen? Where are they going to search? Are they going to look at the chronicles of Assyria and Babylon? What are they going to search for? Because remember the other one, they really direct them towards the the, uh, the Babylonian chronicles to look into that record to see about Judah. But what are that? What is this letter directing them to do? What is it directing Darius to do?
so that he can um, pick up that which was started in the time of Cyrus and continue on. So they're going to look for Cyrus's decree, right? Did Cyrus actually give such a decree for them to build uh, the house of God, right? So this is quite a different search. Now, they're directing them to search. Um, it says, um, uh, to search made in the king's treasure house, which is there at Babylon, right? So they're saying, well, it must be in this treasure house at Babylon that you're going to find these records. Now, that's not where they're going to find the records of Cyrus's decree. Now, is this search going to take some time? It, it's going to take a bit of time, isn't it? Especially since they're, they're not going to find it there. Okay, so we're going to find in chapter 6, it says, Then Darius king made a decree, and search was made in the house of the rolls, where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. But it says, and there was found in Akmetha, in the palace that is in the province of the Medes, a roll, and therein was a record thus written. So, so they're going to look in Babylon, but where are they going to find this? This decree of Cyrus. Media. So they're going to find it in Media, in the kingdom of Media, city of the Median Empire. Uh, Akamatha is the name of the place. Um, it's Ektabana now, Ekbatana, I mean, we call it. It's the capital of Media. It was captured by Cyrus in 550 BC, they say here, um, which I don't know if that's correct or not. But um, it's Ekbatana. That's the place where they're going to find it. So they're not going to find it in Babylon. So it's kind of interesting. They have this decree and where they're going to look, they're not going to find it there. They're going to find it somewhere else. So we don't know how long this took, but I think it took a while. Right. So one of the, you know, so pretty much what everyone does is they say that the decree is given in 520. So they're going to say that this decree is going to be given in 520 B.C. We, we can see how that's impossible. Right. Because they're just going to begin building and probably. You know, it's going to be in 519 that this, this building is going to happen, right? So probably, you know, they, they probably don't start it right here in 520. We have Haggai prophesying. It doesn't look like they have begun this building. Um, so in Zechariah 1, we're going to see, like, he's going to prophesy in basically in 519, early 519. So it's going to happen and commence under the prophesying Hag Haggai and Zechariah. So the earliest it's going to begin is early 519. So then what you're going to have happen is the Samaritans are going to notice that this building has commenced. And then they have to send a message. So they have to get together, decide what to do. They have to send a message to Darius. And Darius has to receive that message. Then Darius has to give out an order for this search to commence. Now, they're looking for this document. So the place where they first look, it's not there. But it's going to be found in Ekbatana. And, and then Darius is going to issue his decree. Now, according to Ellen White, there's more than 20 years between the two decrees. And less than 20 years from when the people return to the land and Darius's decree. So we know that it's in the summer of 516. So can we see it's going to take some time that this search, we don't know exactly when they send this decree, to, uh, this letter to Darius. But we could say that Darius might have received this letter maybe as late as 518 BC. Right? It's possible. 
because it's going to take some time. There's a time that you usually travel as well, usually in the summer. But, you know, they, they could have done it earlier. But somehow they get this letter to Darius and then Darius is going to have this search. And so can we see that it's reasonable that the decree does not occur until 516? And that's going to happen in time to finish and complete the temple. So the, the decree doesn't happen until 70 years after the temple has been destroyed. Uh, thought, anybody? What you're saying is logical. Okay. Yeah. So that was the conclusion that I drew. And, and then I found that Ellen White had that the 20 more than 20 years between the two decrees so but i felt that that decree had to have occurred 70 years after the destruction of the temple and not you know 66 years in 520 it made no sense for the decree to occur <clears throat> it just couldn't right you couldn't have the decree in 520 but every place you look they'll say this decree of darius in 520. Some people will even put the decree in 522, which, I mean, that's just when Darius comes to the throne. Um, but we can see that the decree has to be later. And it takes time because this is it's a much more thorough search. And, and, and Darius continues to search until he finds this. Now, why does he do that? Why didn't Darius just, oh, I couldn't find it. And and then just make an order to stop the building of the temple. What's the principle here that he is following? It has to be. It's got to be recorded. Be okay. recorded. So this is the, right. This is the law of the Medes and Persians, right? Can it be yeah. changed? Okay. So if Cyrus has made a decree, could uh, could could the decree of a false murder, would Darius consider that decree to override the decree of Cyrus? He, he couldn't, right? So first off, false murder is an imposter. And, and Darius knows why the building was stopped. So he, he would start to look into these records. Um, but he knows that there is, is this suggestion that a decree was made by Cyrus. And so he's going to have to find that history because the law of the Medes and the Persians can't be changed. And if Cyrus made a decree that the temple has to be built, then Darius has to support that decree, correct? Yeah, that'd be yeah. correct. Yeah. So we can see that this is not this is not like Babylonians who can just make whatever law they want. Right. For the Persians. This law has to it has to stand. And so they're going to take the time to find this decree of Cyrus. And, and if they find it, you know, in this record house in Ecbatana rather than in Babylon shows the thoroughness in which this search was done. So they're going to find the decree, and then Darius is going to uh, reiterate this decree. <clears throat> so they find the record of, of this decree. It says, in the first year of Cyrus king, the same Cyrus, the king made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be builded the palace where they offered sacrifices and let the foundations thereof be strongly laid, the height thereof three score cubits and the breadth thereof three score cubits with three rows of great stones and a row of new timber and let the expenses be given out of the king's house. <clears throat> and also let the gold and silver vessels of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took forth out of the temple, which is at Jerusalem and brought unto Babylon be restored and brought again unto the temple which is at Jerusalem, everyone to his place and place them in the house of God. 
right? So this is what happened under Cyrus's decree. It says, now therefore, Tatnai, governor beyond the river, Sheth Bozonai, and your companions, Sheth are Bosnai, and the, your companions, the Afarkasites, which are beyond the river, be ye far from thence. So stay away. Let the work of this house of God be alone. Let this house of God, let the work of this house of God alone, lest the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God in his place. Let the governor of the Jews. Moreover, I make a decree what ye shall do to the elders of these Jews for the building of this house of God. That of the king's goods, even of the tribute beyond the river forthwith, expenses be given unto these men, that they be not hindered. And that which they have need of, both young bullocks and rams and lambs for burnt offerings of the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, oil, according to the appointment of the priests, which are at Jerusalem. Let it be given them day by day. So this is daily without fail. So they're going to be providing this uh on a daily basis, that they may offer sacrifices of sweet savers unto the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons. Also, I have made a decree that whosoever shall alter this word, let timber be pulled down from his house and being set up, let him be hanged thereon and let his house be made a dunghill for this. And the God that hath caused his name to dwell there, destroy all kings and people, that shall put their hand to alter or to destroy this house of God, which is at Jerusalem. I, Darius, have made a decree, let it be done with speed. So we can see that this is going to backfire uh, for those enemies, right? And, and so this decree, we, we mark this decree of Darius as the arrival of the second angel's message in our line of the decrees. Okay. So then it says, Then Tatnai govern, governor on this side of the river, Shethar Bosnai, and their companions, according to that which Darius the king hath, had sent. So they did speedily. And the elders of the Jews built it, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Iddo. And they built it and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel. And according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Now, this verse here um, has a few things that we need to note. Now, um, it has here prospered through the prophesying of Haggai and the prophet Zechariah. Now, uh, this idea of through, it sounds in the King James as though they're, they're, they're gonna, that this is happening during this time of the prophesying of Haggai and Zechariah. But we're saying this decree actually happens, um, you know, in 516. And Haggai is going to be prophesying in 520, four years earlier. Um, now, this word through just means corresponding to, right? So they prof prospered. That word prospered, um, um, that means they advanced. Uh, based upon or corresponding to the prophesying of Haggai and Zechariah. Right? So because of their prophesying, they're going to be fulfilling that prophesying is the idea here. Not that they're building this during the time that they're prophesying, because they already started building under the prophesying of Haggai. And then we have another part that's often uh, confusing, so for when people read this, it says they built it and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. So we have here mentioned Artaxerxes. Now, has Artaxerxes made his decree yet in 516? I would say no. No, right? Because his decree is not going to be till 457. Right. So why is he mentioned here? Why is Sarat, I mean, we can see why Cyrus and Darius are mentioned, but why is Artaxerxes also mentioned? 
even though at yeah, this time, sure. what? If I just looking into the future, talking of future, well, the future yeah. plans. So this, the plans. Yes. Right. So this is written by Ezra, and Ezra is there in the time of Artaxerxes, of course, right? And so when he talks about this building of the temple, he recognizes that Cyrus and Darius, they obviously are the ones primarily uh, involved in the completion of the temple here in 516. But he mentions Artaxerxes because you need this third decree. Now, it's going to be something that he's going to describe later in chapter 7, right? So the next chapter, he's going to mention Artaxerxes' decree. But at this time in 516, Artaxerxes hasn't given his decree yet. But Ezra isn't writing in 516. He's writing after Artaxerxes' decree. So he mentions it. But it's important that we see that there are these three decrees. Now we know that Seventh-day Adventists generally um, say which decree is the one that starts the 2300 days and the 70 weeks, right? If Adventists at all care about the 70 weeks, you know, they're going to say, well, it's not Cyrus's decree because, you know, it's too early and it's not Darius's. It doesn't work. And so we have to pick Artaxerxes' decree. But we know that all three decrees are needed. You can't have a third without a first and second. And Ezra is going to be giving us the start of the 70 weeks and the 2300 days as we go through the rest of the chapters in the book of Ezra. So it's going to say that this house was finished in the third day of the month, Adar which was in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. So we can see the house is finished, right? The temple has been built. Now, I've talked about this many times, but as a Seventh-day Adventist, we generally have the impression, you know, that Daniel was taken captive when the temple was destroyed. And we conflate all those events of the progressive destruction of God's people, we just kind of put them all together. There's the 70 years here. And then when it comes to the temple, we just have it finished under Artaxerxes' decree. Because we read this, Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, kings of Persia, that the temple was built and finished. And we just we just read over this. We don't We just read into it what we already assume. And so... I've seen many times people have, and I've done presentations in the past, where we have Artaxerxes' decree is the one that's going to complete the building of the temple. Now, it's true that in Artaxerxes' decree, there's provision made for the temple, that there's some finishing work done. But the house was finished and operational in, uh, well, it's going to be March uh, 12th, so it's the 12th day of the third month on the biblical calendar, it's the, uh, the third day of the 12th month, uh, that they're going to dedicate this temple. And this is going to be 490 years after Solomon's temple was dedicated. Now, technically 400, you know, it's going to be in the, the seventh month, so you go 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, so you can roughly say it's going to be 490 years and five months later uh, that this temple is dedicated. Right. So we have Solomon's temple dedicated in 506. And then we're going to have you know, in the eighth month. And then in the 12th month of the Jewish year 516. So technically it's in March 12, 515 that the temple's dedicated. Okay. So, so this is not generally known or understood. It should be. It's really clear in the spirit of prophecy when you read it. It's actually clear in the Bible when you read it. But we read into things. We don't notice these details. <clears throat> okay. So they're going to, the house is finished in the third day of the month, Adar, which is in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. And the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the children of the captivity kept the dedication of this house of God with joy. 
and offered at the dedication of this house of God a hundred bullocks, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and a sin offering for all Israel, 12 he goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. And they set priests in their divisions and the Levites in their courses for the service of God, which is at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. So they're going to set up the courses. These have to do with uh, how they, you know, which group of people is going to be um, offering at the temple, right? Yeah. So didn't I say Solomon's temple was dedicated in 106 B or 1006 BC? Did I say 106 or something like that? A thousand and six. You said right? five. Six. I think you said five oh six, and I thought five oh six. Okay, I'm almost yeah. certain. A thousand and six BC, and so we have five sixteen BC, four hundred and ninety years later, that the second temple is dedicated. So it's five fifteen. You know, so it's it's four hundred ninety years and and five months. But we can see that that four ninety four hundred ninety years is still there. In, in a biblical year, you know, the eighth month and the twelfth month. So it's, you got these, I guess technically that's four months. So 490 years, and well, I guess it's the seventh month that's dedicated at the end. So it's, it's just a little over 490 years and just a little over four months between the two dedications. Now, then they're going to celebrate the Passover. So the children of the captivity kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. So they dedicated on the third day of the 12th month. And that's going to be in time to have the Passover that spring. So this is going to be in 515 BC that they're going to have this Passover. It's about 40 days after the dedication that they then have the Passover. For the priests and the Levites were purified together. All of them were pure and killed the Passover for all the children of the captivity and for their brethren, the priests and for themselves. And the children of Israel were come again out of captivity and all such as had separated themselves unto them from the filthiness of the heathen of the land to seek the Lord God of Israel did eat and kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy. For the Lord had made them joyful and turned the heart of the king of Assyria unto them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. Now, it's interesting they call him the king of Assyria, right? Obviously, he's the king of Persia, uh, but Persia has conquered Babylon, and Babylon had conquered Assyria. So uh, they're just referring back to this, this idea that he's the king of Assyria, basically the one that had brought them into captivity initially. Right. So it's going back. What had happened with Manasseh being taken captive, the start of these four periods of seven times, these four chastisements. It's now at the end. All of these things have been undone. Right. And, and the temple is now rebuilt. Now, of course, they still have the third decree to occur that has to occur. Now. I want to start drawing these things on a line a little bit. So before we get into Artaxerxes' decree, um, we need to draw a line. And I don't know where I want to put this. Um, I think I wanted to use this one here. Okay, so <clears throat> um, this is just an old line. I already have this copied, so I'm just borrowing this. So if we're going to start putting these things on a line, um, let's move this stuff out of the way. Okay, so we're going to draw a line of darkness. So we got to start with darkness. Well, I've got to share the screen. Sorry about that. Okay, so here's our new line. So this is going to be the line. Well, first we want to deal with Cyrus. Um, I don't know exactly how we should do this. Um, but if we're going to deal with Cyrus, 
Um, or maybe we could call this the line of the temple. How's that? I don't know. Yeah, that'd be, a big, that'd be a good name for it. Okay, yeah. So we got the line of the temple. However we want to understand this. So the temple is going to be destroyed. So I, I think we would place that in here somewhere. So we're going to have um, the 10th day of the fifth month, 586 BC. Okay. So this is going to be this period from the time that the temple is destroyed until uh, what event? So we're going to have a time at the end. We're going to have a period here of 49 years. So we're going to have uh, this next event is going to be Cyrus accession to the throne succession. So we know that's going to be in the fall of 537. Don't know the exact date. Okay, so what's the significance of these 49 years again? Why do we put these 49 years here? What are they representing? A jubilee. Okay, so a jubilee cycle. Okay, I'm, I'm going to move this over a little bit. Okay, so we got a jubilee cycle. That is, we know that, um, at least this is how we understand it, is that symbolically at least, 586 is a sabbatical year. Now, we know that Zedekiah, he was seeking to observe the sabbatical year. That is, he had made a law that they were going to, or not just the sabbatical year, but the Jubilee. But he was dissuaded to change his mind. Now, we're not certain that he may have been planning this sabbatical year in 585 BC, or the Jubilee year, pardon me. So 586 would have been a jubilee year, but instead the temple is going to be destroyed. And then that would mean that 537 is going to be a sabbatical year, right? So, so we're just going to say that this is a sabbatical year. And the same thing here. So this is going to be a sabbatical. Okay, makes sense. So then 536, when they return to the land, they return to their inheritance. We'll, we'll actually just have like the return. Let me see, I'll do it this way. Um, we'll do the return here, and we'll just say it's um, it's going to be 536, but it'll be the first day of the seventh month. Okay. Um, so maybe I'll put return and build altar. Okay, so they return and they rebuild the altar. So this is going to be a jubilee. Okay, that makes sense. 
And we can see how the, when they return to the land of their inheritance, that it's fitting that it's a jubilee year. Now, whether this is actually the jubilee year or not, I don't know. Right. But at least symbolically it is. Can we agree with that? I can agree with it being symbolic. Yeah. Okay. Now, you know, one of the things that, you know, we have tried to do is figure out well, when does the jubilee year begin? So, you know, if we have, uh, so we'll just take 537. So 537 is a sabbatical year. Um, one of the things we see in this history that I think is important. So, um, so 723 BC, what's 723 BC? What, what do we mark? Why do we mark 723 BC? What, what is that about? The captivity of Hosea. Okay, it's the captivity of Hoshea, right? So he's the king of northern Israel. He's going to be taken captive in 723. And we know that that fits in with these sabbatical cycles that connect us to the 1260, right? That is yes. 723 BC, it's 1260 years to 538 AD. And then it's 1260 again. So so those are obviously sabbatical year cycles, right? Um, we can see that, that that cycle is, it's 180 sabbatical cycles to get 1260. Okay, Does that makes sense to people? Because we know that uh, 18 times 7 is 126. And so we're... So 180 times 7 is 1260. We also know 18 times 70 is one, uh, 1260, right? Okay, so, so we could connect that back there. Now, how many years is it from 723 to 537? It's 186 years, right? Now, is that significant that we can go back to 723 BC and come to the accession of Cyrus and see that it's 186 years? Now, of course, that's not a sabbatical jubilee cycle. It means if we look at 723, 723 doesn't fit into a sabbatical cycle, but it gives us a, a significant span of time. 186 years is the number of, of, of ordinal uh, or cardinal days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. So if we go to 536 BC, the Jubilee, it's going to be 187 years, right? So we can see that this, that this story of them returning to land ties us back to 723. Okay. <clears throat> I on this I I'm agreeing with you that this ties us to 723. Yeah. Now I'm going to send a a copy of something that I was putting together because I was looking further at this with 457 and 408 as we were talking about with Daniel 9. Um, so four, four fifty seven and four four oh eight. Yeah, the forty nine years there, which we we know are are going to be significant here with this forty nine years. Correct. Now they're not going to be a span of time that's going to fit. That is, if we go from we know if we go from five thirty seven, and we subtract four fifty seven, that we're going to have eighty years, which is not divisible by seven, right? That's so, we know that, so we know that that 49-year cycle doesn't match up with this 49-year cycle. <clears throat> I agree that it doesn't yeah. match up, but as, as we are addressing this being at least symbolic. Right, right. So we know that, that, that we don't have to have this 49 years as the actual sabbatical cycle. Right. 
Now, okay. now we have we have um, the Israelites uh, leaving Egypt in 1533, and we have them crossing the Jordan in 1493, right? And and so you know we could say, well, can we match this up? Now we know that one in seven times we're going to be able to match up any date, any arbitrary date with any other date, right? But but if we go back to 1493 BC and uh, we subtract, you know, um, uh, 536, or we could subtract 537, it depends what we want to do. So if we subtracted 537, we get 956. And if we divided that by seven, it wouldn't line up, right? So that is, we can't take a date that we would normally think of as being a sabbatical year. We can't just easily line it up with these. That is, this sabbatical cycle doesn't appear to fit with other supposed sabbatical cycles that we could create, right? But we're, we're saying it doesn't have to. It's, it's symbolic at the very least. And, and that's what matters here. Okay, so go on, Dwight. The point and the reason that this is of interest, at least to me, with, with what we're addressing right now, in the study that I have been led to consider out of Maccabees, mm -hmm. in the 150th year of the Greek rule, which we would be able to assess as being 163 BC, mm -hmm. they were then allowing the land to rest. They were allowing this because they had no food in Jerusalem. And we have this same situation being addressed in the spirit of prophecy when the walls were looking to be rebuilt. Mm -hmm. Now, in considering this prior to the camp meeting, it was interesting to me that if symbolically we looked at the 49 year period from 457 to 408 as being seven periods of allowing the land to rest. Mm -hmm. And if we were to, in a BC format, begin adding seven year periods at 457 BC, we then again come back to 723 BC, at least as being a symbol of the land sabbatical. Yeah. So, so we know from 457 to 163, right? That's the date you have there, right? Correct. That is correct. That's it's 42 sabbatical cycles, right? Right. Now, now so, so, so I just want to point out that, you know, we have a one in seven chance if we take any arbitrary year, uh, you know, two arbitrary years that they're going to be uh, seven years of, you know, some cycle of seven years. Right. So so we know that 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 that's the case. Um, yet here we have it being 42 cycles of seven, which would be a significant symbol. OK, now. <clears throat> considering from some of the items that Stephen had presented and that we were addressing at the camp meeting or that I, I brought out the camp meeting, if 191 BC is the center point mm -hmm. of the 434 years that remain of the 490 years prior to the beginning of Christ's ministry. That year comes up in that sabbatical cycle. Right. As does 317 BC, 254 BC, 128, 
and 65. Right. All of so we have all these different ones, and, and that's going to make sense based okay. upon the 191 is the center of the 62 weeks. So we know by definition 191 is going to be in connected with 457 in cycles of seven. Now, it happens right. to be 38 sabbatical cycles. That is, what, what, you're, what you're doing is you're taking uh, uh, 31 weeks, right, plus seven weeks. Correct. Right? So, so people who follow what I'm saying. So seven weeks from 457 to 408, and then another 31 weeks to get to 191 BC. And um, so that's going to be the case, right? It, now, we're marking 191 because it's also going to be four sabbatical cycles from 163, right? Correct. So it's going to be another 24 years, 24 years apart. And, and then we know that 38, if it's 38 years, that, that it's also two um, uh, metonic cycles. Correct. Right. Okay, so so those things are just going to be plain bare facts. And then it was it was intriguing in this same type of a a situation that the years twenty seven A.D. and thirty four A.D. would also have been sabbatical years, right? Which they would have to be based upon the seventy weeks. And then we would the the final the, the final points would have to also include that 62 A.D. the year in which James was stoned would also be part of this. Mm -hmm. So at least as a symbol, there would right. be yeah. So we see it as as <laughs> these symbols, and we can take certain events. And we can place it in these cycles of sabbatical years, and we can see that there's some structure there. So we had, had done that before. So, so you know, we just, so, but we know that they're not the same sabbatical cycle, but they don't have to be because they're symbolic. Right. And, and so people are always trying to find the actual sabbatical jubilee cycle and especially apply it to our day, usually with some kind of time type of time setting right so they figure if they can find out which year is going to be the sabbatical year or the jubilee year then they can they can predict you know some event usually it's the second coming right and and back in uh, 1980 85 i was confronted with the 1987 jubilee which of course jesus didn't come back in 1987 and so there was then the 19 94 jubilee seven years later and pastor friend of mine he wasn't a pastor at the time but before he was a pastor he spent a lot of time probably as much time studying the 1984 jubilee as we spend studying the things that we're studying you know all day long just studying it for, for, for about six months or so and um and i was studying it too because I, i'm reading what spirit of prophecy says about time setting and so I convinced him to give it up uh, prior to 1994. So he ended up giving up the idea that Jesus was going to come back in 1994. But he studied it out. Now that he's studied it out, he's not willing to look at anything that I'm doing because he thinks it's just time setting. We already did that. We've already been through that. But we can see what we're doing is different. We're not looking for the second coming of Christ. And we're not trying to find the actual sabbatical jubilee cycle in our time so that we can predict some event, right? We're just trying to understand it as a symbol in the past. And, and so this light, I, I think, is important it, because it tells us something here just about when they return, that it's, it's a jubilee cycle from when the temple has been destroyed, right? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so so we're going to come back to, to to setting out this line, however it's it's going to look. So we're just going to do the line of the temple. Now we could do Cyrus by himself, which I think we should do. Um, 
but I, I'm still not quite sure how, how to address that. But here, I at least want to address the line at the temple. And, um, you know, so, um, yeah, we're going to deal with that 187 years, too, which I still think is really significant, 186, 187. A any other final thoughts on this before we close with prayer? And, and just one other thing. So I did uh, the first study uh, with uh, in Romanian there, which is on now. Now they're gypsies, but they're also called the Roman Romani, Roman Romani people. The Romani, uh, yes. Romani, yeah. Which is just another. They always call themselves gypsies. <laughs> so you know, some some Romani people take that as derogatory. Uh, but this group doesn't seem to, but I, I'm going to refer to them as Romani um, people. So now it's in Romanian, which isn't related to Romani, you know, even though they look kind of the same. It's not really uh, related. Um, uh, so. So anyway, we, we did that study and that went really well. So I got nine more studies to go. So I need your prayers on that. Um, but anyway, so so we're going to. Uh, Close with prayer. Mm -hmm. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful uh, for the time that we've had here this morning. And we just ask, Lord, that um, you can be with us throughout this day, that you can continue to help us as we study through these things to understand them. Um, we give our hearts to you. We ask that you can use us to your glory. And we pray for the various studies around the world, for people searching for light. Um, we just ask, Lord, that you can um, bless the other studies that I'm doing and for any studies that others are doing in reaching those that need light. Um, bring us together again to study these things according to thy will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.